Hello everyone, and welcome to How to Read the Bible. Over the course of the next several sessions, our hope is that we're gonna provide you with tools and resources so that you will finally be able to read and understand the Bible on your own. Most of you who are tuning into this class, you didn't go to school for this, you didn't go to seminary, and so we thought that we actually have our responsibility as a church to give you tools and resources so that you can read and study and better understand the Bible on your own. Because uh, the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal, is that if we can deepen and enrich and kind of better our understanding and our relationship with the Bible, that is only going to better our relationship with the God that we find in it. And so uh, friends, a couple of years ago, we as a church, we decided this was gonna be one of the core classes that we teach at our church, Uh, really for two reasons, because number one, uh, the Bible is uh, it's a complex book. It's a complex book with very strange stories and very strange characters. Karl Barth, uh, a, a 19th century theologian, used to say this. He used to say, if you want to understand the Bible, you need to be ready to enter into the strange world within the Bible. And so uh, that's exactly what these tools are meant to do. They're meant to help you and I better understand, give you a roadmap um, as to how to navigate this world that they're occupying so that we can better understand what is the message that they're, the message that they're trying to convey, okay? And the second reason why uh, we as a church, this is a value of ours, we wanna make sure that we teach this class every year, probably a couple times a year, uh, is because this is probably no shock to you. There's a lot of different interpretations of the Bible out there. Depending on what church you go to, they're going to teach you and coach you to read and approach the Bible very differently. So you'll go to some churches that say, no, this is the this is the literal word of God. You need to read it and apply it literally. Every single verse, every single chapter. And then there are some Christians out there who hold it a lot more loosely, uh, who say these are just, these stories maybe didn't even happen, they're fables, they're kind of just ancient tales. We're really just trying to get to the principles of the stories and apply those to our lives. And so which is it, right? Which is it? There's a lot of uh, range, broad ranging opinions out there as to what to do with the Bible and what authority it ought to have. And so again, those are some of the questions that we're going to hope to answer over the course of these next several sessions so that we can increase your competence when you go to reading the Bible and uh, so that you go to it with the right expectations, uh, so that when you're reading it and you're studying it, uh, it aligns, it's consistent uh, with the God that you believe in, uh, in Jesus. And so with that said, that's a perfect segue to what we're going to cover here in session number one. Because you see, friends, before I can even teach you how to read the Bible, we actually have to back up a bit and ask, what is the Bible? What is this thing that we study at our church every single week that we talk about all the time? What is the the nature of this thing? And so for the answers to that question, I'm actually going to invite you to go on a brief history lesson with me uh, so that you come to understand how actually the Bible came to be formed. It came into being. And I want to encourage you This is a perfect time to hit pause on this video uh, and access the application guide uh, because the application guide that we've created to kind of act as a companion to this study is gonna answer a lot of questions. It's gonna provide a lot of graphs and charts and different things that are gonna hopefully be really uh, resourceful to you and maybe to your small group. Maybe you and your small group are taking this class together. And so if you don't have that out or you don't have that opened, feel free to pause and go ahead and open that and have that ready as we go into this first session. So uh, this first session, what is the Bible? What is the Bible? Uh, Friends, uh, one of the things that's really, really important to note, and again, if you're looking at the application guide, you'll see this, uh, that on the timeline that we've created, the first plot point uh, that we've established was really just helping all of us understand uh, that how the stories of the Bible came into being are very different from how stories come about today. So for example, uh, when something happens today, Uh, We have journalists, we have historians, we have people on the ground trying to chronicle the event, how it happened, to get the facts right and get the characters right. That's not necessarily how the Bible came uh, into being, especially not in the very beginning. Uh, Many of the stories, especially in the beginning parts of the Old Testament, did not occur in real time. So what that means is uh, there wasn't someone following Abraham along. There wasn't someone following Moses along, trying to chronicle in detail every single uh, sort of fact and figure of the story. Uh, these, these weren't live events. They, they, the, the, the stories that happened um, mostly uh, were eventually uh, sort of passed down or chronicled 
uh, orally, which is the second uh, plot in the timeline in the application guide. So the second thing that is helpful to know about the Bible is that many of the events in the Old Testament, they weren't written down immediately, they weren't chronicled immediately. And so how they survived, how these stories early on, Adam and Eve, Abraham, Joshua, uh, these stories survived uh, was orally. These, these were traditions that were passed down. They would tell these stories at festivals and rituals. Uh, why Passover was such a massive celebration in the Old Testament wasn't just because uh, the people of God were celebrating the liberation that God enacted for them from Egypt, which was really, really important, but it was also not just for celebration. Festivals were also educational. Uh, they were also educational. They were meant so that they could pull the kids, they could pull the, the future generations in close and teach them stories that they would not have known. They would have, they would relive moments that they themselves did not experience. And friends, uh, this, uh, this sort of practice, this sort of exercise went on for uh, at least a thousand years, right? At least a thousand years. So most scholars agree uh, that the first time that the events of the Bible, and when I say the Bible, I'm talking specifically about the Old Testament right now, the events of the Old Testament were not written down until about 400 BCE. So that's 400 years before Jesus, which now look the other direction. That's nearly a thousand years after the life of Moses. That's over a thousand. So these stories were passed down orally, just, just by speech, just by memory for over a thousand years to generation to generation to generation. And then at about 400 uh, BCE, uh, the, the people of God finally started writing these stories down. Most scholars uh, believe that this occurred in what's called the post-exilic era. Post-exilic era is just a fancy word for after they were in exile. So if you know the story of the Old Testament, you know that uh, the people of God at one point, uh, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, they come down, they conquer them, they kind of haul them off and make them live as prisoners in exile in their land. But eventually they come back to their homeland and one of the first things that they do, um, is, at least for, according to scholars, is they say, okay, we can't pass these down by word of mouth, uh, by, by memory anymore, we have to write these down. But it's important to know that those stories of Moses and, and a lot of what we see in Genesis and Exodus, those were not written down until over a thousand years later. And so uh, about 400 and then kind of like nearing 200 BCE, so about 200 years before Jesus shows up, a library begins to be forming, okay? So a library, so they begin to not only be writing these down, but they begin to, there's some consensus as to, okay, uh, these books seem like scripture. We ought to kind of keep them together. We ought to read them more and make it a practice to study them more. And so around 200 BCE, there seems to be a library forming. The Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, uh, starts to become forming, uh, and it's becoming formalized, formalized, uh, if you will. And we see evidence of this when Jesus shows up. So uh, when we go into the Gospels, when we see the life of Jesus unfold, we see him actually refer to the scriptures. He talks about uh, the scriptures. He talks about uh, the Bible uh, in a sense when he references Deuteronomy and Isaiah and Psalms. We see Jesus make frequent reference to those scriptures. In fact, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus, it says Jesus walked into the temple and he read from the scroll. He read from the scriptures. And so there seems to be some evidence there. Uh, that uh, when Jesus shows up, there was a, a, a Bible in place already. Now, but that's, that's actually a really important thing for Christians, us here in 2020, to understand that oftentimes when the Bible talks about Scripture, uh, specifically in the New Testament, uh, it's not talking about the New Testament yet, right? Uh, these authors that were living during New Testament times, they were actually talking about the Old Testament. They're talking about this Hebrew Bible, the Scriptures uh, that encompass the Old Testament, what is now known as the Old Testament. Okay, so uh, for example, when you see Paul in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3 say that all scriptures God breathed, he's not talking about his own writings. He's not talking about his own letters. He's talking mainly uh, about the scriptures uh, that came up into that point, the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew scriptures. But that begins to change. That begins to change, right? Uh, so eventually... As we get into the times of the New Testament, uh, after the times of Jesus uh, in particular, uh, there's an additional library beginning to form, right? There's an additional library beginning to form. So beginning about uh, the about 51 AD. So this would be, again, so uh, to kind of keep us uh, steady on the timeline, this would be about 20 years after Jesus has already died and ascended into heaven. 
About 20 years after that, there's a, a, another library beginning to form uh, with Paul's letters uh, and the letters of the other apostles, Peter and John and other folks. They're writing stuff down and they're, they're circulating it to the churches and the church is doing something similar that they were doing in the Old Testament. Back in 200 BCE, they're, going, they're starting to go, oh, th these seem like scripture. These, these seem like uh, letters we ought to pay attention to and read and reread and reread and study. And so uh, Paul's letters, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, these uh, what now makes up a lot of the New Testament, there began to be some consensus that we ought to sort of kind of keep these together and maintain them uh, to some extent. And then we get the Gospels, the Gospels. Uh, the Gospels actually aren't written. Most scholars agree that most, uh, that most of the Gospels are not written until 30 years after Jesus uh, had already died and ascended into heaven. And so uh, most scholars also agree, this is what's also fascinating about the ancient time and sort of ancient journalism or ancient literature, is that while we might have a very, very strong commitment to you know, no plagiarism and, you know, if that person, like that person has to write it because they were the first person, uh, they were the, 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 you know, they were there at the event, so they can write about it. That's not necessarily the value that was held back in ancient Israel. So. Most scholars agree that when you look at the Gospels, so again, the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the ones that just deal with Jesus's kind of biography. Most scholars agree that those were not written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, they were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's disciples, their followers. And so again, we see this oral tradition of the passing of these stories still living on in the New Testament, that some of these stories of what Jesus did and what Jesus accomplished were passed orally, at least for a short period of time, before they were finally written down by Jesus' followers' followers, if that makes sense, if that makes sense. So that brings us to about the end of the first century. So the end of the first century, uh, we, there's, there's some consensus about like, okay, these books, these gospels seem to be uh, books that we should be reading and including into our already pre-existing Hebrew scriptures, the, 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 the Old Testament. They didn't call it that back then, but it seems to be like there's an Old Testament. Now there's like a New Testament kind of forming. And so by the time we reach the third century, if you read theologians like Justin the Martyr, uh, and Irenaeus and other theologians, they will say that they, they seem to suggest uh, that there is some consensus on which books, which letters were beginning to be considered scripture and which were not. But here's the crazy part. Here's the crazy part. That is not, that list isn't formalized until the 1500s. You heard that right. So the list, the Bible, the Bible that is in your house, the Bible that we study in church, wasn't formalized until the 1500s. And so that means, again, for over a thousand years, uh, there, there might have been some consensus, but there were other sources, alternative letters, alternative gospels. Like there's a gospel of Thomas out there that maybe you didn't know about, that some of the church members, some church, some Christians would have been reading, studying, and, and, and holding to be authoritative. And so the Bible, as you and I have come to know it, uh, didn't get formalized, didn't get the first, the fancy church word for this is canonized, it didn't get canonized until the 1500s. And so the place, just another one quick layer on top of that, is uh, the Bible that you and I enjoy and we study and we read and we preach about uh, every week. One other important thing to know about that is that uh, the Bible that we have uh, is based off of manuscripts uh, that were also not the original manuscripts. So some of you who study the Bible before, you know this to be true, but probably many, many of us don't. And so we might may have thought that the Bible that we have at our home or at church, it's a direct sort of uh, just a translation from the Hebrew or the Greek into English, and that's the original copy. But that's not necessarily true. The oldest manuscript we actually we have of the Old Testament um, is a manuscript that was most likely written around Jesus' time, around Jesus' time. And the oldest manuscript we have of the New Testament wasn't written, wasn't uh, written down till 125 AD. So almost a hundred years after Jesus is gone. And so I say all that to you to help you understand that the translations that we, why there's so many different translations of the Bible out there, in fact, is because so many scholars are trying to uh, find other manuscripts because uh, they believe this manuscript was more accurate than that manuscript and this manuscript is older than this one so we need to keep to this one 
um, and they're trying as best they can to translate it into English in the most accurate way from their original languages. Whew. Okay, let's take a breath. We took a very, very brief history lesson very, very quickly. Why is that important? Why is that important for this conversation? Well, friends, here's the deal. Uh, again, like I said at the very beginning, long before you and I can learn how to read the Bible, we first have to understand what the Bible is, how it actually came into being. And one of the things I think is really, really important to know about the Bible, or, or to, to just be honest about with the Bible, is its human side, right? It's, it's human nature. That the Bible that we experience and we read and we study today, it passed through so many different people, so many different contexts, so many different histories, so many different cultures. And it's normal that uh, the fingerprints of those authors and their particular context rubbed off on the Bible that we experience and we enjoy today. So there's a human side to the Bible. And before that kind of freaks you out or, or, or you know, unsettles you, I would just say this is actually uh, really, really good news. It's really, really good news because uh, one of the things that becomes problematic when you hold to, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, when you hold to such a strict view of the Bible that it, it, it can't contain any errors, it can't contain any uh, discrepancies, well, the truth of the matter is, is that the Bible does. The Bible does. There's, there's different authors chronicling different stories and sometimes they use completely different numbers. So like there's passages in First Chronicles uh, when compared over and against First Kings where they, they count the number of people in an army differently. And so that's, that's a discrepancy, right? Um, there's, a, there's another passage that talks about David uh, taking a census. And it's one uh, author says that the Lord told him to take the census. And there's another passage that says that Satan told him to do it. That's a classic example of a, of a discrepancy, right? And so when you hold to such a strict, literalist reading of the Bible, when you come across those, uh, it causes you to lose your confidence uh, in the book. Um, but if you can shift, you can shift your expectation to the Bible to not necessarily being so focused about reading it literally, um, but instead focused on trying to read it literately. I'm borrowing a phrase actually from Rob Bell. He actually says that's actually the key. Now, the key is not reading and applying the Bible literally in all these different places, but it's reading the Bible literately. Uh, it's learning what was going on during that time. What was going on during this, uh, you know, this in their culture and in history and politics? Like what was going on during that time that might have informed what it is that they were trying to say to us? Because once we're honest about that, once we unveil that, we begin to see that there are some passages of scripture uh, where they are absolutely spot on. They are absolutely saying something that is in direct congruence with who Jesus is. But then there are other passages that seem to fly in the face of who Jesus is and how Jesus would have wanted us to live. Passages that condone violence or passages that condone misogyny or slavery. Those problematic passages that you and I are already familiar with, right? And so I guess what I'm trying to help us understand is that the humanity of the Bible is, is not a thing we ought to ignore. And it's not something that we ought to be scared of. It's just some, something, something we should pay attention to and be mindful of, um, and then use that when we go to the Bible, use that as an expectation we take to the Bible when we read it and try to understand it. Uh, maybe I'll say it this way. One of the things that I say to students when I teach this class often is, <clears throat> think of it this way. Um, the Bible is often declared as the word of God. So all of it, every verse, every chapter. Instead, I might just sort of uh, suggest an alternative. Maybe we ought to say the Bible contains the Word of God. It contains the Word of God. It contains the message and the life that Jesus is trying to proclaim. But we got to go find it. We got to go find it. Sometimes we got to dust off different places, or sometimes we got to dig a little bit deeper to find it. We got to go searching for it. And so again, uh, in the application guide, I kind of give you uh, what it is, uh, our definition of the Bible, our sort of working definition of the Bible uh, that we have here at our church. Uh, and friends, uh, it's really, uh, so if, again, if you're looking at it, it's this. Uh, we say uh, the Bible is the best attempt of the people of God, located within very specific historical, cultural, geographical, and a political context. They're trying their best to grasp the movement and the message of God. 
And so does that mean that uh, sometimes they are right when they capture the movement and the message of God? Absolutely, they absolutely are. Does that mean that they're wrong sometimes? Yeah, yeah. And oftentimes, maybe more often, uh, what they're trying to grasp at, what these authors are trying to grasp at, is just not complete yet. It's not complete yet. So they've, they've captured an essence, a, a piece of who God is and what God's like. But the conversation has to continue and we have to continue to dig at uh, who this God is and what type of life this God wants for us. So friends, uh, that is session one. Session one, what is the Bible? Uh, I hope uh, that this conversation today at least started the conversation, gave you some things to think about. And so this is a perfect time uh, for you to go ahead and head over to the application guide uh, by yourself or with your small group. We've got some discussion questions there. Uh, go ahead and go to those now. And we're going to look forward to seeing you for session two. Thank you.